I'm going to move on to introduce um, Steve Nathan. This is really a great session. All of, all of the, the speakers are um, long-term colleagues and friends, I think, have a lot of great experience to share with you. Steve um, has really led the, um, a lot of the work in this area of pulmonary hypertension and ILD, and he's going to share with us past studies and future directions. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Al. Um, thank you to the Foundation for inviting me to give this talk, and thanks to everyone hanging out uh, until the last session. I'm curious, by a show of hands, how many folks in the audience are patients or, care or um, support personnel for, for patients? Okay, all right, good. So, I'm going to talk about uh, the topic on hand pulmonary hypertension in interstitial lung disease, and these are my disclosures. <clears throat> when we classify pulmonary hypertension, there are five different groups. I'm not going to get into them in any detail, but lung disease and interstitial lung disease falls under the category of group three pulmonary hypertension. All the drugs that we have, and I'll show them to you, are approved for group one pulmonary hypertension. There are no drugs approved for group three pulmonary hypertension. Uh, these are all the drugs that are available for pulmonary hypertension. If I do mention them, it's in the context of off-label. Uh, as mentioned, none of them are approved for use in patients with interstitial lung disease. If one looks at the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in IPF, and IPF being the prototypical uh, disease of the interstitial lung diseases, we have the most data here, the prevalence varies anywhere from as low as 8% to as high as 85, 86%. So it really depends when in the clinical course one looks for it, and the more severe or the more uh, symptomatic the patient is, the more likely it is that they have underlying pulmonary hypertension. If one looks at the distribution of the pulmonary pressures, and we define pulmonary hypertension as a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 25 or more, you can see that most patients with IPF have generally mild pulmonary hypertension. Most of them are in the 25 to 30 range, maybe 30 to 35, so pretty mild. However, if one looks at the association with outcomes, any pulmonary hypertension is associated with significantly worse outcomes. So the question that arises is if, is if we have two patients, Mr. Orange Dot over here, Mr. Green Dot there, can we put these patients on treatment and do this, keep Mr. Green Dot on the green line, and get Mr. Orange Dot up to the green line and improve the outcomes of the patients who would otherwise have not a very good outcome. So that's the concept. What I believe happens, and I think there is evidence to support this, is that once pulmonary fibrosis advances and once patients develop pulmonary hypertension, they follow the same course and the same pathway. If you look at patients with NSIP, for example, we know that NSIP has a better prognosis and outcome than IPF, but once their diffusing capacity gets to less than 35% are predicted, their course is very similar to IPF, and it might be that a, a DLC of less than 35% is a good surrogate for pulmonary hypertension. It might indicate that these patients have now developed pulmonary hypertension, and that's why they behave as if they have IPF, or very similar. If you look at patients with chronic hypersensitivity and you look at their outcomes once the DL gets to less, less than 35%, it's very much the same as NSIP and IPF patients. Going to this concept that progressive fibrosis, you get vascular involvement, pulmonary hypertension supervenes, and the patients follow the same pathway. And this is demonstrating that concept that maybe the ILD is driving outcomes, but patients get to this inflection point where pulmonary hypertension becomes the driver of outcomes. And this is a similar cartoon depiction. Can we help patients who have a breathing limitation? They have interstitial lung disease, they have pulmonary hypertension. Which one is causing them to be symptomatic and shortness of breath? And if it's a pulmonary hypertension, can we do this by putting them on one of these pH therapies and improving their pulmonary hypertension so that their parenchymal lung disease then becomes the limiting factor? We know what happens, uh, we know what may happen when you put two bad diseases together. This is what may happen, ILD plus pH. It's this gentleman meeting this gentleman here. And so the outcomes are not very good when we put both of these together. And I've shown you that already. These are all the drugs that are approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So it becomes very attempting, very appealing, appealing almost seductive to take these drugs and give it to patients with ILD, IPF who have pulmonary hypertension. So the question is, should we improvise in ILDPH with these therapies? And one has to be careful when one improvises because someone can get hurt. 
the horse could break a leg, for example. I don't care about the guy doing the handstand. He's, uh, he's doing that uh, volitionally. So one always has to be careful. Sometimes things that make intuitive sense don't pan out. Caveats to empiric therapy. Uh, theoretically, you can worsen BQ mismatch, worsen oxygenation, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease I'm not going to get into, but if there's fibrosis around the vessels on the venous side of the circulation, you can cause the dam to, to back up by putting them on a, a drug that increases the RV output. So PVOD, like lesions, can occur in interstitial lung disease. Similar concept for occult heart failure. And then I think what we're learning is that if you have extensive parenchymal lung disease, it might not be a good idea to dilate the remaining pulmonary vasculature. So I'm going to uh, show a couple of tables of some of the studies. Most of these have been small, open label, retrospective, that have been done targeting the pH of ILD. I'm not going to talk about them all. I have them color-coded very nicely. Green is good, pink or red is not that good, and orange is equivocal. So there's some of the studies. You can see the numbers are pretty small for the most part. Uh, a, lot of, a lot more red there, a little bit of orange, some green. So it's really uncertain in terms of whether or not we should treat. I'm going to talk about the STEP IPF study. This was one of the three studies done by the NIH IPF network, which I think provides some kind of proof of concept. Uh, STEP was a study looking at sildenafil in patients with IPF, with the main inclusion criteria being a DL less than 35% are predicted, so once again enriched for patients who have pulmonary hypertension. The primary endpoint after 12 weeks was a 20% increase in the walk distance. Based on this, this was a negative study. However, if you look at some of the tables from the New England Journal publication, there are a bunch of secondary endpoints that did appear to be trending positive or statistically significant in terms of quality of life, oxygenation, diffusing capacity, and um, mortality. There was a small signal, although not too much was made of it in terms of the mortality difference, four deaths in the sildenafil arm versus 11 in the placebo arm, and the p-value, once again, the numbers are very, very small, p-value of 0.07. A subgroup analysis from STEP IPF, I think, is, is very instructive because in the subgroup analysis published in CHESS, they, uh, the authors looked at the patients who had some evidence of right ventricular systolic dysfunction, and if you look at that subgroup, in fact, these patients did appear to have a significant improvement in their walk distance, almost 100 meters. So this goes to patient phenotyping. And is that the subgroup we should be going after in patients with interstitial lung disease, those patients who develop evidence of right ventricular systolic dysfunction? Let's talk about rear cigarette, because I think there are lessons from the rear cigarette story. Rear cigarette uh, works on the nitric oxide pathway. It's uh, the one drug that's approved for both group one as well as group four pulmonary hypertension. And there was a small, op uh, a small study done out of Europe um, looking at Rio in patients with interstitial lung disease, only 22 patients. But there was a signal there that suggested it could be of benefit. The walk distance increased, the hemodynamics improved, and this was the basis for the RISE RIP study. Um, I was privileged to be the principal investigator on the study. Hell was on the steering committee as well. And uh, after a couple of years, this was eventually published in September, I believe, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Uh, so RISE IP was the largest study to date. I think we had 147 plus patients with various forms of interstitial lung disease and associated pulmonary hypertension treated with rear cigarette. These were the inclusion criteria. We try to keep it pretty broad, FEC greater than 45%. They had to have pulmonary hypertension, and um, they had to uh, be symptomatic. I won't get into these in any great detail. This was the patient, uh, the patient demographics. Looks, looked like we were getting the right group of patients into the study. The mean PA pressure was around 33. The FEC was around 75. So they had what appeared to be mild restriction FEC, mild restriction, and uh, almost moderate pulmonary hypertension, around 33. My big fear going into the study was that we would recruit patients with FECs in the 45 to 50% range and mean PA pressures in the, in the 25 to 30 range. You can see the breakdown of the patients, very similar to the known uh, prevalence of disease. Most of these patients had IPF. Well, um, 
we, uh, I got a call from the Data Safety Monitoring Committee uh, about two or three years ago, and they said you need to be on a teleconference in the next hour, and together with the sponsor, got on the teleconference, and the Data Safety Monitoring Committee said, we recommend that you stop the study for increased harm to the treatment arm. And I'll show you why they did that, and they did that appropriately. So if you look here in terms of the main phase of the study, <clears throat> there were eight deaths on Rio and three deaths in the placebo arm. So <clears throat> not huge numbers, but after the patients finished the main part of the study, they rolled over to open-label treatment, and there were a bunch of patients formerly on placebo who were then going to roll over to receive rear cigarette, and this is what concerned, appropriately, the DSMB, the deaths of patients who were previously on placebo and then got rear cigarette. So the study was stopped, and all patients were taken off drug within about 24 to 48 hours. So, a quote to get some solace from this, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact, and that's why we do the clinical trial. Sometimes things make intuitive sense, biologic sense, physiologic sense, and you subject them to clinical trial and it doesn't pan out. So, why did RISE fall? And I have four C's here. Did we get the patient composi composition wrong, the wrong phenotype of patients? Did we have the wrong drug, compound wrong? Was the trial conduct wrong? Did we do something that we shouldn't have in the context of the trial? And most importantly, is the concept wrong? Should we not be targeting the pulmonary hypertension of interstitial lung disease? Is this an adaptive phenomenon rather than a maladaptive phenomenon? So this brings up the notion of clinical trial design and the many different parts and many different moving parts you have to get right. You have to have a drug that works and is well tolerated. Once you get the pull through there, you have to have the right dose and frequency, route of administration, the right patient population that is likely to be recruited and retained, and then you have to come up with the right duration and the right endpoints. And if you slip up on one of these things, you can have a negative study. If you get them through all those little pinholes, you can have a pull with a pulse. So let's talk about some of the studies that are out there on, and ongoing. This is a study um, of inhaled ambulatory nitric oxide for patients who are on ambulatory oxygen, and it includes various forms of interstitial lung disease. I'll show you the results of cohort one. Cohort two is fully enrolled. The results will be available later this year. And if cohort two is positive, then we'll move to cohort three, which will be a phase three study with actigraphy as a primary endpoint. And this is something that the FDA has signed off on, which I think is a step forward in terms of clinical trials and, and outcomes. So um, inclusion criteria are here. I won't get into them in any great detail. Patients have, have to be on oxygen already, FEC greater than 40%. And these were the results, sorry, these are the demographics of the first cohort, 23 plus 18 patients, very similar, maybe a few more IPF patients in the I know 30 group, that was the dose of inhaled nitric oxide. And the results are shown here, Actig actigraphy was the, primary, was the end point we focused on, and MVPA stands for moderate to vigorous physical activity, and you can see that there was a difference in terms of the I know group versus the placebo arm. So once again, uh, we await the uh, second cohort, and that will be out hopefully uh, even by December or January. I think this study is very interesting. This is the in-stage study. Most of the folks in the audience are familiar with this. What about using the antifibrotics together with a treatment that targets the pulmonary vasculature? Once again, the study was enriched for pulmonary hypertension with the DL less than 35%. It was a negative study based on the primary endpoint of the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire at 12 weeks, but there was a lot of intriguing data, and that's the St. George's, um, didn't show a difference, and some of the intriguing data is shown here. What if we had, or if the, um, the sponsor and the, the steering committee had chosen this, the UCSD Shortness of Breath Questionnaire as a primary endpoint, this would have been a positive study. And what was equally intriguing was the difference in the change in the FVC favoring combined therapy with sildenafil and nintenanib. So hopefully more to follow around this, but certainly intriguing data. And there was a biomarker that showed that treating the pulmonary hypertension with sildenafil did make a difference through the NT Pro BMB, or the BMP rather. Um, other ongoing studies, there's a similar study ongoing with sildenafil and pofenadone. We hope to get a readout of that later on, uh, uh, I think late 2020. So there's some excitement about that. 
uh, in terms of what, what that might show. Uh, it's going to be a longer term study, more patients, and so hopefully we cautiously optimistic that we'll get a good result from that. Um, the increased study, I think, is a very important study. This is using inhaled troprostanol in interstitial lung disease. This is and will be the biggest study to date in group 3 pulmonary hypertension. It's fully recruited, and we hope to be able to present. The results should become available first quarter of next year, and we hope to have a presentation at the ATS. Um, so look out for that. I think that potentially could be a game changer one way or the other. If it's positive, that'll be fantastic for everyone, especially the patients. If it's negative, we're going to have to rethink this whole concept of treating pulmonary hypertension in interstitial lung disease. Uh, we've shown the baseline characteristics from the increased study. It looks like a good group that we have there. You can see the distribution of the different diseases, uh, more moderate uh, restrictive physiology, but good PA pressures, the mean PA pressure around 37. So, um, cautiously optimistic we'll get a good result from this. So what are the chances to demonstrate that treating pulmonary hypertension in the context of interstitial lung disease will be of benefit? This next quotation kind of sums up where I'm at. Some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well informed just to be undecided about them. And, uh, and I don't pretend to be highly intelligent, but the more you, you discover about this, what seems like a relatively simple con uh, concept, the more complicated it becomes. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions later. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Okay, I have a question for you. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm getting to ask all my questions. Um, I really liked your four C's. I think that's a nice way, an important way to think about why things maybe don't work. It's not, it's not just the compound, it's other things. And I wanted to focus on the concept one and, and ask you about that in the context of RISE IIP, but also other studies which you didn't have time to go through, but we're, we've, we've tried a lot of compounds, um, I'd say some different designs, and we haven't had a success. What we've had are either negative studies or harmful studies. Right. What, are, um, it, so it must be the concept that is driving us forward. Are, 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 can you speak to that, and are we, I mean, it, it does make sense that it should work, but when do we, how, how do we think about that given yeah. the big investment and time and patient's time? Yeah. How, do, how, do we, how do we think about the... One of, my, of one of my favorite all-time movies is Rocky. And every time Rocky got hit and went down, he got back up. And sometimes I feel like Rocky doing these clinical trials. But I get some comfort from, if you go back to IPF, and I actually had a slide showing this. How many negative studies did we have in IPF before we had the positive studies? We can go back and look at all, you know, Tanicept, you know, Gleevec, um, ACE, uh, you know, um, uh, Panther, all these studies were negative, and many more, alpha interferon, gamma interferon. We had many different negative studies, and eventually we got it right. So I think we have to persist. I still think in my heart of hearts that there's a phenotype out there that benefits. It's just a question of defining it and showing it. And I could probably design a study that would be positive. We could take patients with mild IPF who have mean PA pressures of 45 or 50, that'll probably be a positive study, but we won't recruit. It's a rare, that's a rare situation. So we, when we think about these clinical studies, we have to try and enrich for success through the phenotype, the endpoints, but we also have to make sure it's a recruitable study as well. Thanks, Steve, that was a good answer. Back of the room. So hypoxemia is a great driver of increased pulmonary vascular pressures, and to what extent is that the elephant in the room that we don't have a biomarker for and are not measuring? Um, I, I think we're getting better at uh, picking up hypoxemia earlier, treating it with supplemental oxygen. Uh, when we did a deep dive into the data from RISE IRP, one of the things we focused on was, well, are we increasing VQ mismatch in the group who got rear, and that's why they did poorly, but we could really find no evidence of that. Uh, we, we had serial six-minute walk tests, and 
all the patients desaturated significantly, whether they were on placebo or Rio. There was no evidence that Rio increased VQ mismatch. So certainly uh, hypoxemia could be playing a role and uh, likely does. I mean, sometimes we, we measure uh, uh, pulse ox or forehead probes, but that doesn't tell us about regional hypoxemia within areas of the lung and we might not be fully appreciating the role that hypoxemia has to play. So, but it's much more complicated than just hypoxemia. There are other elements, certainly, that contribute to the pulmonary hypertension. Because I was thinking of nocturnal hypoxemia also. Uh, it's, it's possible, um, but I think we had more or less equivalent groups in RISE IIP, so I don't think that's an explanation for it. And hope, I think that is something that perhaps is underappreciated that we need to be looking out for more just in, our, in terms of our, our holistic care and management of, of patients with ILD. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Steve. Sure.